My name is Gassia Mikhaelian. I'm an anchor and reporter at KTVU Fox 2 News in San Francisco in the Bay Area here in California. I'm happy to welcome to discussion about how coronavirus is affecting many aspects of life, Shannon Garrity, an elementary itinerant visual arts teacher serving the San Francisco Unified School District. Shannon, thanks for being with me. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I, I'm so happy to talk about the arts. And in, in your usual role, you serve students at three different schools within the San Francisco Unified School District. Clearly, children aren't in school, and teachers are finding creative ways to teach. Tell me how you're teaching art. Art can live in so many different ways. It's really an exciting time to push the boundaries of creativity. And I think when we think about art, we think about paint sets and clay and all of these official art materials. But now we really have the opportunity to see that we can make art with very little and that creativity lives all around us. So what can we do with a pencil and a pen? How can we use recycled materials? How can we even use our laundry or a things in our pantry to create sculptures. And so one of the exciting opportunities that I have as an art teacher is to really show the validity of art in, in outside world and how it can live in our everyday life. There was a time not so long ago that I could not so much as recycle a toilet paper tube or get rid of the egg carton without one of my two sons saying, wait, I want that. You know, I have dibs on that. I'm making a blaster and I need that. So it was amazing how without spending a nickel, without leaving the house to go to the art supply store, we were able to really create kind of a maker space of random things that would have maybe gone to waste otherwise. And they did turn it into art. Is that what you're hoping more families do? Yes, you know, um, even in the classroom when we're making things, I find that children's imaginations expand well beyond whatever the parameters of the art experience that I'm offering. And now we get to really let our children take what's in front of them and expand and explore because they're just natural, natural imaginers. And this is the opportunity for us as adults and parents to let them take what's in front of them and play. Um, I imagine you're setting up Zoom meetings. How, kind of, how does the mechanics of all this work? Yeah, so I offer episodes. So I create 30-minute art-making episodes that much remind me of a television show, at least, for students to be able to access when it's good for them. You know, uh, kids are sharing multiple devices, parents are working, when is a good time? Wouldn't it be great if kids, you know, fourth grade, second grade, fifth grade came together and all did the art episode together at once and then collectively see as a family or as a group within a home, you know, what did we make together? What did we make individually? So, so we do, I do episodes. Um, I also have an opportunity for students to deposit their art into a platform so we can all look at it in a gallery style way. And then we meet on Zoom from time to time to, to talk and to share ideas. I know that San Francisco Unified, like many large uh, urban school districts, was and perhaps still is struggling when it comes to um, access for all of their students. And San Francisco Unified, the, the, the superintendent said, we don't want to start learning when some children may not be able to get on board because they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have a device. So, you know, of course, I think of math and reading and spelling as being very tech dependent. Um, do you think art is as tech dependent as perhaps, you know, the, the traditional three R's? I don't think so. And I think that's one of the reasons art is so valuable. Art is, art is so most multifaceted. It's, it's transferable. It's not only a vehicle for our expression and for our processing of, of what we're experiencing and for us to lend our voice to, to our world, but the, art intersects with math and science constantly, history, constantly, communication. So it really is the epicenter of all learning and you need a pencil. Right, right. And I also like about art that there is no right or wrong answer and it can help you, you know, so often you process what you're feeling. You know, I used to be a big journaler, um, but, but also through visual arts, you process how you're feeling and sometimes it feels better when it's on the page. You know, sometimes language um, acts as a barrier and art kind of overcomes that barrier and allows us into worlds in ways that, you know, sometimes we don't have words for or experiences. And sometimes we become surprised with what we find at the end, you know, that's something we learn from ourselves and we can communicate to others in ways that we can't always through our words. It's, it, 
art is an incredibly powerful vehicle for, for expression and for processing. Have you thought ahead to when you do get back in the classroom, whether it's, you know, middle of August, as was originally scheduled, perhaps earlier, maybe later, have you thought about what your new classroom is, experience is going to look like? I think we're going to have to find out what the parameters are and what the guidelines are. What I do know is that teachers are highly creative problem solvers, even in everyday life before this experience happened. You know, it's, it's never as we think it's going to be. And we're constantly iterating. We're constantly in the moment deciding what needs to happen next and how we're going to approach it. So I think it will be the same in that way. You know, kids are resilient. Kids really have excellent ideas. Whenever I need an idea, I just say to the class, guys, you know, this is what's happening right now. How do you think we can solve this? And I don't really have to, to use my own sol solo abilities. I just gather them and ask them. So I, I, I love we'll it. figure it out. We will. You know, I, I mean, they will. I have to say, as adults, um, I think we have so many, you know, I think, oh, maybe we could, oh, no, too expensive. Maybe we should, oh, no, can't go to that store. And I, I shut down my own ideas much more quickly than, than anyone else would ever shut them down. And that children don't have that filter yet. Um, it can be so beneficial in so many ways. Yeah, Dr. George Land, he did an excellent study with NASA. NASA wanted to find their most creative people in their organization. And so he created this inventory. And what he found is that five-year-olds, 98% of them tested on the highly genius, highly creative scale of creativity. And as we become more indoctrinated into society and more fear entrenched and more trying to conform, uh, we lose our creative thinking. And by the time we're uh, adults, only 2% of adults tested in the highly creative genius category. So what can we do to cultivate our creativity and to, and to keep it alive in our five-year-old selves? Because creativity is responsible for the world around us. So we need it. So the more we can can allow our inner five-year-old voice to live, but also give voice to the five-year-olds and the six-year-olds and the 10-year-olds, um, I think the more um, successfully we'll, we'll solve our problems that we're facing today. They know they are resilient and they are much smarter than I think they get credit for a lot of times. I'd like to have you um, help guide some of the grown-ups who are spending an awful lot of time at home with their children, um, you know, sort of doing art on the kitchen table. Uh, you know, growing up, uh, I'm sure when I was seven, I thought I was a great artist. And of course, now that I'm 45, I think, oh, I can't even draw a stick figure. Yeah. I have learned to bite my tongue every time I am tempted to say, my boys will say, mom, you know, draw me a race car, draw me a horse. And I think to myself, I can't draw that. But I say, let me see what I can do. Can you, can you help us through some of that language that, that, that helps avoid that I can't draw, I'm not an artist feeling because I don't want them ever to have what I feel? Yes, yes. Thank you. That is such an important question. And I think this transfers to learning as well. Art is a process. It never ends. I always say in my class, art is, is never finished. It may feel grounded, it may feel whole in that moment, um, but it lives. Even when you put an oil painting on the wall, it shifts and it changes. Um, and so we approach art uh, as ish. And this is a reference to Peter Reynolds' book, Ish. Um, but it's also a reference to just how we talk, you know, like, oh, we're having a party, when does it start? Oh, come over around eight-ish. You know, and so ISH ish. And what that means is that it's human, it's coming from us. It's not going to be this machine replicated product like we would get from a store. And actually, that's what makes it really interesting. When we see the human hand in art, we have a visceral response to it. That's what resonates with us is this sort of uh, imperfect, um, human made piece that emotes an experience. And so uh, the more ish it is, the more exciting and interesting. And, you know, I like to show my students artists like um, Basquiat. Basquiat um, has a very primal, rooted feeling to his pieces, and the world has resonated with it. His art sells for millions now. 
So, you know, art is very subjective, just like life. It's a process. And if we can just really savor and engage in that and allow it to not always end up the way we think it's supposed to or we think it's going to, we give permission to ourselves to let our art out. And then we also give permission to others to let their art out. And it becomes this powerful experience for everybody. I've watched uh, my, my little boys are into like BMX racing and they, they get this um, uh, USA BMX magazine. I don't know what it's called, but there is a drawing competition, right? And you can win, you know, any number of BMX gear and gloves and whatever. And I will tell you, my little nine-year-old is putting more effort and concentration into this array of art he's going to send off in hopes of winning, you know, some gloves or something. Um, he is applying himself more to this project. He wakes up excited with new ideas. He goes to bed talking about what he's going to do the next day. And it's funny because I think some people say like, oh, that's just art. How is, is his schoolwork going? And I say, no, no, this is the biggest thing in his world right now. And so it's just amazing to watch him take ownership of something that, you know, even maybe I would have sort of poo-pooed a little bit in normal time. I think you're touching on something really interesting called flow. And flow is the state of being, it's like the zone that we get in. It's kind of a hyper focus where we really feel a sense of meaning and purpose in what we're doing. And normally when we, we get into the state of flow, it's because we have an authentic audience. We have an end result. We know that we are giving to somebody and they will be receiving it in a way where they get it and we get it. Um, and so whenever we can offer opportunities for sinking into flow, and and what that means is that we're meeting a task where we, where we can access it, but we find a sense of challenge, but it's an accessible challenge. It's a reasonable challenge. So we want to keep going. And then we have parameters. We have constraints. Oh, well, there's a deadline. It has to be a bike. It has to be this kind of thing. Uh, we create this container for our creativity to push against, and that allows us to expand our boundaries. But the real key ingredient is having an authentic audience, someone to share this with, someone to give it to, someone to interact because that's what art is it's interaction it's communication and when we get into that space and when we sink into flow our cortisol levels drop our stress levels decrease and the implications of that are wildly transferable when your son stands up I bet that he is able to go and access the rest of his life in a very different way and his productivity probably upticks that's what the research shows um, the way that he approaches other concepts in his life and you know we know art is transferable there was a recent study that followed um, out of rice university that followed 10,000 students and they found that those students who engaged in art more often performed better on standardized testing so you know it, it art is beyond measurable really it really is it's the epicenter of of life and the more that we can find ways to integrate it into our life i think in my own experience and my observation of others uh the better our lives will be i agree i wish we could talk about this for an hour but i yeah. have to wrap it up and i, and I have one <laughs> more last quick question for you sure. i know a number of arts organizations um have sort of thrown open the doors and they're putting performances online, they're offering music up for free, things that typically people would have to pay for. When this is all over, I, look, I do not expect San Francisco Opera to keep offering opera for free. I do not expect San Francisco Ballet to keep putting its ballets up in full for free. When we go back to normal, what do you want people to remember about art and artists and how it helped us get through this time? Yeah, I, I want people to remember that life doesn't happen without art. And there are people behind that art that also need to exist and live and thrive. And one of the ways that I'm able to make my art is because I'm also able to satisfy my basic needs. And, um, you know, art, art is free in many, many ways. And art lives in the world in ways that we cannot measure. And also, we need to support those who are in this process. Anyone who's engaged in art understands that it is a process. And to um, be able to play a bassoon takes hours and hours and hours and days and years of, of work. And we need to support that because we benefit from it.
So that's what I hope everybody remembers. Well, I, I, I accept your words. And, and I will also say that I'm lucky enough to talk with you during Teacher Appreciation Week as a parent oh, yeah. who is helping to, you know, to distance learn with my two little boys and my husband is taking the lead. But I can tell you, every parent I talk to say that we appreciate teachers now more than ever. And, you know, we joke that you guys should be paid a million dollars a year, but it is no <laughs> joke at all. So what you provide... <laughs> To, to the children you serve here in the Bay Area is, is just, you know, invaluable. So thank you for, for your service to your community. Thank you for your art. And also thank you for joining us. Shannon Garrity, art teacher with San Francisco Unified. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And if you'd like more information on this or any other topic, you can find it anytime at coronavirusnow.com.